Jumbo, assalamu alaikum, Iskawaran, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this panel session um, titled The Revolution Will Be Live Streamed. Um, my name is Guled Meyer. I am a Fulbright Scholar and a Fellow at the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs. Um, in my spare time, I run uh, Third Culture Minds, which is a charity organization dedicated towards advancing positive mental health and well-being outcomes for young Kiwis of refugee and migrant backgrounds. Um, the focus of today's conversation for this panel is really looking at the double-edged sword of social activism. You know, the ongoing struggle for social justice and racial, racial justice in the public square has unfolded alongside a takeover of the virtual one. Amid the cell phone footage of protests and toppling of statues, the internet has been further inundated with what we might call as social online activism. The digital space has really given voice to so many marginalized um, communities to share their outrage, their grief, their trauma, anger, um, but also their resiliency um, within black and brown communities, both here in Aotearoa, but also across the world. It has unified a diverse range of group of people, activated our common allyship, and demanded actions, but not without a price. We know that on hate still prevails in online spaces far much more than on offline spaces, and that the hate that prevails in those online spaces are much more likely to actually take effect in offline settings. So there is a negative side as well. Um, and joining us today, we speak with young leaders behind the historic 14th of June Black Lives Matter in Wellington that attracted roughly approximately 20,000 people, according to the Wellington City Council. Today, we're going to talk to this um, panel about their experiences with online um, social activism and just generally in terms of using the internet to be able to engage in issues of social justice and human rights. Um, in preparing this session and actually putting this together, I, I just want to um, give a quick acknowledgement to the team at Internet NZ for pulling together this fantastic conference and really bringing together a diverse range of speakers on really such important topics. Um, when I was approached to help, um, I guess, bring this conversation about, the thing that was on my mind is that we know from evidence that when it comes to online hate and abuse that people of color are far much more likely to receive it, people from marginalized backgrounds. But the evidence shows overwhelmingly that in particular, women of color are the ones that receive the far most significant hate and abuse in online spaces. So for me, it was a no brainer to be able to use this opportunity to be able to amplify the voices of black and brown women um, and, and I really could not be more proud um, to be on this panel with such intelligent and um, amazing young leaders in our communities. So I'm just going to um, introduce them um, briefly. So we've got uh, Nicole Enskip here. So Nicole is a New Zealand-based African-American racial justice advocate. She moved um, from the United States and, and, and was working in areas of youth mentorship and so forth. Um, and has really been passionate about it, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. What I forgot to mention in introducing, just before I introduce Nicole, is that for this session, we want to specifically look at the Black Lives Matter, um, I guess, movement as a particular case study in terms of um, online social media activism and the experiences that people are having in that space. But it's, it's, there's, it's not just exclusively limited to Black Lives Matter. This is a much more broader issues as well. Um, we also have um, the lovely Vera. Um, so Vera was part of the young organizers behind the, the rally in, in, in June. She's currently finishing her bachelor's in psychology and cultural anthropology at, the, at Victoria University. Um, and we're also joined alongside her is, is Beth. Uh, Beth is also a student at Victoria University. And she has been a member of Voices of Araha, which is a radio show that aims to represent diverse voices and issues surrounding minorities and was also a key influential figure behind the Black Lives Matter rally. Um, and finally, we have Yana. Yana is from Poriroa in Wellington um, and is of Afakasi background. She works um, in, in, for, for A2 Union um, and is passionate about empowering people of color 
um, and marginalized communities to stand up for their rights at work and standing up against um, racism. Uh, Nicole, if I could just start this conversation um, by, by coming to you first, can you just, I guess, you know, the internet has been really influential in, in, in bringing movements like Black Lives Matter um, that really started somewhere distant um, to here in our shores and making it feel, feel, feel seen and heard. Can you talk to us in terms of, I guess, a, a bit about the role that the internet has played in, in bringing the whole movement about? So I, I believe that the internet's been vital in creating an awareness that can't be ignored. Um, it, within the Black Lives Matter movement, there's always been the, Black people have always had the agenda of Black Lives Matter, but as far as it being something that everyone cannot ignore, I think that's where Black Lives Matter came about as a movement that is like an official movement. Um, because there had to be a platform that we could stand on and say, hey, this stuff is happening. Please stop ignoring it. Please be aware of the fact that this is not okay. This is not something that should be happening. And no one should ever be treated different for the, for the color of their skin. Um, and so I believe that the... The degree as to which, mm. as to what um, the awareness that people had yeah. um, just elevated to another level. And yeah. I think it, it has its po it has its benefits and it has its um, downfalls. And, and you're absolutely um, right. I, I, I do want to touch a little bit more, drill deeper on some of those benefits and, 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 and I guess downfalls. And um, I mean, to, to put it perfectly, I guess, blunt, you know, um, being from the black community, I guess just to kind of echo what Nicole was saying there in terms of um, the impact of the internet and, and the game changer that it's been. Nowadays, we have mobile phones. Everybody can record videos, um, you know, and, and, and I kid you not, it's, it's, it's a defense mechanism for many of us, you know, when we are racially profiled um, or, you know, abuse is held at us. That's, that's our evidence nowadays. We never really had that back in the day. So, Nicole, you're absolutely right in that these issues weren't really just something that's just come about now. It's just that the internet has allowed us to be able to amplify those experiences. Um, Vera, Yana, and, and Beth, I, 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 I want to come to you guys in, in no particular order here, but basically, I, I, I guess I want to talk to you guys about your experiences with with the Black Lives Matter rally, um, bringing about 20,000 people um, to Wellington, but also not just that in terms of what's happening in the online space, but also in the offline space um, and the advocacy work that is going on there. Can you um, talk me through it? Um, Beth, did you think that you would ever be part of, I guess, something where through the power of the internet would be able to bring, you know, call, basically create one of the biggest rallies that's ever occurred in Wellington's modern history? Um, no, <laughs> definitely not. Mm. Um, but I just, yeah, I've always kind of felt like, um, it was just in me to kind of like stand for something that's, you know, injustice, it just like being in high school and just like experiencing just, you know, what I've gone through. And I just kind of like, you know, I've always realized that I would eventually kind of fall into that, um, kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the whole experience, it was kind of like everything was happening kind of like fast from like what was happening in the social media and just like seeing people that kind of that like look like us, you know, being killed, you know, and the whole like, it just mm. a whole like exchange of like just energy and just feeling so drained. Um, it was kind of like we just, yeah, you don't really have, I don't really kind of have time to kind of like think about like, oh, mm. I'm kind of like a part of something that's, kind of big and even mm -hmm. afterwards after seeing the people like show up and it was yeah it was kind of like it took it, it didn't kind of hit me like mm -hmm. straight away mm -hmm. it was um it was kind of like yeah there was I mean I was glad to be to do the work that was like needed mm -hmm. and to kind of yeah stand for you know injustice that was happening um yeah, yeah. it's happening yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Vera, talk me through, I guess, your experience um, 
in the lead up to that moment um and 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 i guess you know even even for me and you i guess that's where we met um in in the lead up to organizing the rally right as a result of the internet essentially being able to connect us and bring us all together um tell me about your experiences but just before you answer i just want to for our audiences that are that are listening to us please remember to uh send us your questions um uh, you know, you can post them on Slack and, and the other, um, I guess, options that have been um, provided to everybody. Uh, so please send that through. I will be filtering through that and answering them. And also there will be an opportunity for uh, questions and answers as well. So um, please keep dotting those questions and, 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 and bring them along because we want them. Um, but sorry, Vera, back to you. Tell me, tell me about your experiences. Um, well, I think thanks to the internet and especially like social media, like one of my friends put it so nicely for the first time, um, black people in America and like the black diaspora everywhere, they were connected. And so kind of that connection that you felt through social media and all the videos and everything. So when um, Beth asked me if um, I wanted to join and help plan the march, it was like, of course, of course I will. That's like no question. And um, I think it's also really important to understand how, especially in this March, mm. social media was like the number one tool that we use, right? Mm. So um, we used uh, Instagram and Facebook to promote um, our March. We asked people over social media if they wanted to volunteer mm. and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, mm. it was really yeah, yeah, no, nah, that's 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 really really great to hear. Um, uh, Yana, I guess, what do you? The question that I want to ask you essentially, and this is, is somewhat of a difficult one. I do apologize, but um, I guess can social media catalyze or support political change? Um, given your experiences of Black Lives Matter, I mean, it was great to have a rally, right? It was great to be able to bring people out. But, you know, like I said, the real change is what happens in those times and the months um, that happens and so forth. So the, the work is still cut out. There's so much work that needs to be done. But I guess, yeah, do you really believe that social media can catalyze or support the political changes that we all as young people and I guess, you know, citizens of, of, of New Zealand and the world are seeking? Yeah, I think that, um, it, you know, like everything, it has its pros and cons, right? So the pro, like Nicole was talking about, is that it put the movement on the forefront. It put um, the lives of black people, which is, you know, our our wonderful woman here, that's, that's you know, their experience, especially in America. And so um, it did put it at the forefront. And those of us, you know, who weren't living in, in that experience or living in the States, I mean, for me personally, I was connected to it because I have, you know, black family in America. But mm. I think we, if, if you come from an activist background um, here in Aotearoa, we were looking for a way that we could show support that was more than just what we were doing online. Mm. Um, and so, and that was what the rally did, right? It kind of, it took the, the activism that we, because we were starting to mm. share the Black Lives Matter videos and we were mm. starting to share the information coming through. But what, we needed to do was show our support in a way that was offline. Um, and that's, I think, the first difference is how do you show activism that you're doing online to mm. offline? And that was showing up to the rally. But you're right, because then what's kind of happened again is it's gone back on, all online, mm. which is fine. Like, it can it can continue to work in that way that we uh, can continue to um, bring the movement out and have those conversations. But again, those conversations need to be had offline. So I think that it's it's done amazing things and it continues to, but it's like you say, mm. uh, until we do those things offline, it's all just going mm. to be, yeah, things that we watch and see and not things that we do, yeah. Beth, in your view, what makes someone a social media um, or online internet, I, I guess, activist or advocate? Um, it's, it's, does, does, does posting a black square on Instagram count? <laughs> Um, I think, um, it's the influence that someone has, like, yeah. um, to kind of, cause the whole, um, purpose of activism is getting people together and spreading the word and like mm. having people be connected. So I think if someone is doing it from the right place and kind of have the right messages and formations out there and not misleading people, 
I think, yeah, then that's a good, yeah, that's how I see. I, I, I want to touch upon a couple of things that you said just in, in depth in shortly, um, Yana, you spoke about, um, uh, sorry, Beth, I think it was you and also Yana about the videos and seeing that on social media. I want to talk about that. Um, but Nicole, um, I guess how, like as, as, as an African-American who's here in New Zealand, um, you know, I guess in a way you are far much more connected to these social issues. I've always said that, you know, systemic racism um, in, in USA is connected to that of, you know, of, of I guess, settler, yeah, settler, colonials, settler colonial racism in, in, in the US is connected to that of ours here in, in, in Aotearoa. Um, from a global perspective, uh, I guess as an African-American who's here in New Zealand witnessing this, um, knowing that you know, the, basically that's your people, right? Like, I mean, uh, yeah, how, how do you think that social media or just social media activism have elevated um, social justice movements and particularly in relation to Black Lives Matter? Um, I think it's, I think it's um, unified um, people that mm -hmm. would typically disagree with each other um, on, di on different things. You kind of, have to put things to the side when you see the severity of the injustice. And I think social media showing the severity of the injustices that are happening made people mm. kind of put aside their differences mm. and people could unify on a common, um, on common ground. Mm. Um, I think it has, um, it's just, it's just made it very, very like in the forefront of our minds. Mm. Um, sorry, mm. can you repeat the question again? Yeah, sorry. yeah. How how do you think it's 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 elevated these movements? Um, I guess I guess in in addition to bringing people out and making them aware about the issue and stuff, have you seen it result in you know I guess tangible um, policy solutions and so forth? I mean, I, I guess. In America, we've been talking about defund the police, right? Um, yeah. Which is a radical concept that we probably, I don't think it's radical personally, but I guess it's, it's something that you would not have thought that, you know, America or, or that would so many voices in America would be asking for this and particularly yeah. more and more um, progressive um, political people. But, um, you know, I, I am someone who's a cynical person and sometimes I believe that, you know, um, there isn't much change happening and so forth. But uh, yeah, I guess, I guess, are you thinking, are you seeing that it's having, elevating, you know, the movement in a way positively? Like, what do you think overall? I think it has. I think okay. because now our all marketing platforms have mm. shifted to what they used to be and are now all social, social media based. Mm. So all of our political figures rely on social media to push their mm. agendas and social mm. media to get them where they want to be. Mm. So if the entire narrative currently on so or the majority of the narrative on social media is geared towards the injustice that's happening to people of color mm. and black people, mm. um, specifically also in the states, mm. these these po these politicians are essentially being pushed to address things that they would normally let slip mm. let. Mm but um, keep to the side. Mm. Um, and I also think that with social media and the marketing that you see happen on social media, you're able to reach a, a wider base of people. Um, so a lot of the marches and stuff that have happened, you see the grand scale of it because all of the marketing is done on social media. Mm -hmm. All mm. of the information is out on social media. So in mm. the States, when you see in the different major cities, people were coming from out of state to go to these marches. Mm. Um, and they're only knowing about these because of social media. Mm. Um, it's not as hard yard sort of grassroots as it used to be. Mm. Um, and I, um, I think that is 100% due to the internet and social media and the accessibility of information now. Mm. Um, has really changed the game. And I think as far as the defunding the police, um, yeah. the police can't hide from the stuff they do anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I yeah. think it was easy to discredit yeah. victims yeah. Um, previously because there was no evidence. And now because 
there is video evidence, there are people showing up and there are people sticking around when bad things are happening Mm -hmm. and checking in and holding them to account, which I don't think that happened in the past as much. Or when it happened, those people would put their lives in jeopardy to another level because something could happen to them and it wouldn't be, um, there wouldn't be any evidence of what's happened to them. Mm. Um, But yeah, social media has played a huge role in also protecting um, Black people from police brutality, which uh, not all police are bad, but there are really bad police. There are really bad people that are part of that system that can use that job to inflict pain onto people. So I think it's really kept, kept a lot of people from... Yeah. being at the brunt of that you know or every time being vi- um, video the the analogy that i actually love to use when um i guess explaining um you know uh black and marginalized people's relationships with the police is you know people will be quick to dismiss it and they'll tell you no you know that's just one rotten um i guess apple but actually it's a rotten barrel that we're dealing with um, and that barrel that's rotten is the institution. So when those fresh, good apples are in ye- for years and years institutionalized in that rotten barrel, damn mm-hmm. straight, those apples are all going to go rotten. So really, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to get at, okay? Understand that the issues that we're trying to address are systemic. It's not individual. Like, yes, there's individual racism and so forth, but that's the bigger beast of the issue that we're trying to deal with okay so we're not even talking about none of this nonsense about casual racism there is nothing casual about racism um sorry before i get carried away i guess beth i i I, sorry Vera. i want i want to i want to come to you on this question um and and i kind of was trying to tease it out in an earlier question that i had asked beth about you know people posting the, the the black square right the, the thing is the issue here is that nowadays um you know when people like us who are doing the advocacy the real work on the ground both online and in offline spaces like that's that's the real mahi that's where the real mahi is at right we, but nowadays it's like cool you know i remember when i guess even in 2016, you know, fighting racism back then, 2017, before even things like Christchurch had happened, and I guess brought a prominence to these issues or whatnot, which is a good thing in many ways. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say to you is that this work is tiring. It's not glamorous work. Fighting racism is not glamorous. It's exhausting. I cannot tell you how tired I am. Um, But at the same time, nowadays, it's like it's a bandwagon for people to be able to come through, right? Look at me, Black Lives Matter hashtag. Um, hey, here's a can it, like how do we dis- distinguish? Let's distinguish social media activism and advocacy. What are we talking about here? Do you see that Vera as advocacy, or is that just point blank performative stunts? And why is that problematic? Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, I think it's very hard in a way because. Social media to a very, to a certain point is quite shallow, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can post anything, write anything, but if you don't actually mean it, then it has no actual value. So I think the thing with advocacy and activism is that even though you post things on social media, it still has, um, there's still action behind it. Mm. And so I think for me, like, Um, or like for others, yes, you see what people are posting on uh, social media, but then you can go back home and you can start kind of educating yourself a bit more about the topic Mm. and kind of see the topic in a way more in-depth view. And then you can start kind of um, focusing on Mm. people around you. If your Mm. friends make like a semi-racist joke, just be like, no, this is actually not okay. This, I don't find this funny. This is not Mm. okay. Mm -hmm. And And just like, more things that can later on build up to like yeah. um, planning a match, you know, yeah. doing like bigger things. Yeah. No, that's that's a really good point. Beth, what is your message for people right now, audiences that are tuning yeah. into this and thinking, okay, I I feel like I, you know, have, I guess I want to play a role in this. I want to contribute, you know, use my skills and knowledge and, and so forth in, in this space to be able to bring positive social outcomes through, you know, online and social media engagements. 
How do you, what, 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 what do you have to say to them to ensure that I guess they don't fall into that trap to, you know, ensure that it's not just a performative sign and that actually they're doing the mahi. Mm. Let me make just advice around that. I think it's about integrity. Um, it's about doing things when people are not like looking at you and clapping for you, you know, mm. um, you can kind of feel like you did the work by like sharing something and then move on with your life. But then it's for black people, it's like their reality, you know, it's like what we have to live through, you know? Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, kind of using your privilege and using your kind of like your position or, you know, the resources that you kind of have to make an influence, mm. um, make a change within your workplace, within, you know, kind of like to influence these toxic cultures that we have at work and, mm. and um, at the and it's important. It's important that they are conscious that they do not hijack a movement. Am I right? So there's a role that they can play from behind. Is that right, Beth? Yeah, 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 for sure. That's why you go to the people that are experiencing injustice to kind of be informed before you go and do something, um, making sure that you understand the history, you understand kind of the cause, um, kind of checking in, um, your motive and making sure that your motives are right and kind of your intentions are like in the right place. So okay. Um, no, thank you so much for, for that, but that's, that's really good. Uh, can I just remind the audience, we've got about 20 minutes left for this conversation. Um, we just received our, 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 a question. Um, I see that's come through. Please, um, uh, you know, if you have anything that's on your mind, right now's the time to ask these fantastic, incredible um, women who've given up their time to be able to talk to us. So uh, please send those questions through. In fact, one has come through and and Nicole, I'm going to ask this one um, to you. Uh, basically, the questions from the audience um, and uh, they are saying that, you know, their question is, does the ability of the tech giants to analyze, you know, your data and directly influence your behavior concern you? For example, being an activist and a, dis and, and, and a dissenter could lead to more posts, um, could lead to more posts from the platform owner that will make you respond angrily. You could get angry more often. Your mental health deteriorates. I, I, I want to, the whole thing about mental health, please park that bit up because I want to talk about that separately in a wider conversation. But I guess I'm interested in your views on, on that question, um, Nicole, in terms of the ability of tech giants to analyze data. So I think the positives and the negatives, uh, the positives are that you see more of the realities that you, I guess, subscribe to. So if you're wanting to know more about the Black Lives Matter movement, you can find more information that comes to you due to these, um, the, these data insights. Um, a negative would be the people's minds that you're trying to change. They also ha are on these websites and on these platforms where mm -hmm. the data is catered to them. Mm -hmm. So the narratives they see fit the views that they have. So then changing their mind when, when the, um, when these platforms kind of filter information to them is really hard. Mm. Because their reality is completely different. Um, and they live inside of a reality that's completely different to the experience that we have. Mm. So, mm. And, and what they see continually confirms that what they think is true. Mm. Um, and so then you struggle with this lack of um, the full picture for mm. everyone. And then it also can be a bit of sensory overload for, mm. for black people, because you're like, I continually see suffering and your brain can only take so much mm. of that information in yeah. without um, yeah. being overwhelmed. And that mm. kind of stems into the mental health stuff. So mm. I'll wait to address yeah. that. Um, but I think there's a big problem with okay. these sort of data and, and analytics that they do on these social media platforms and even on like web browsing platforms like Google. 
Yeah, I think I think the, the thing that I'm most concerned about is when it comes to these social media um, giants and all these tech people is their ability to be able to reduce harm. And 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 actually now is a per that's a perfect segue for the next part of this conversation. We've just spent the vast majority of the session actually speaking about the positives. It's time to speak about the negatives because there is an ugly side to it. Um, and it's important that we be able to talk about it. Now, NetSafe, um, a recent report by NetSafe, a um, couple of months following the Christchurch um, terror attacks, revealed that over, you know, just over 50% of Muslims in New Zealand had experienced online hate and abuse. That is post Christchurch. So I think if anything, um, you know, we are definitely seeing that hate and bigotry and racism is definitely on the rise. Um, look, despite our you know greater social, I guess, consciousness about these issues after Christchurch has not meant that we are now bitter. Um, I'm, in fact, I, I, I am probably more worried about the place in which we are in today um, in the sense of complacency that exists. So in terms of the internet, we know that online hate is, 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 is extensive on the internet. From my personal experience, um, I guess being a vocal advocate and putting myself in public spaces um, has meant that I've received a lot of hate. Um, you know, I get a lot of abuse on, you know, every time I express my perspectives, or especially every time I'm in a news story or a media story, that's just, you know, they have a field day um, in, in, my, in my mentions on Twitter or just random unsolicited messages and so forth. So from a personal experience, I guess I have really seen firsthand that ugly side. Um, I mean, to the extent where I have, you know, on occasions have received quite threatening um, abuse um, and messages, like threatening in nature that I've actually had to go out of my way to be able to report it. Um, and my experiences in terms of actually with the police and reporting it is, is, is a whole new story of its own. We could have another conversation panel discussion on that one in terms of how police deal with that. But Yana, on the day before and the morning on that day of the rally, something happened. What happened? Tell me. Uh, well, so I guess I, um, you know, not being black, one of my main things coming into the Black Lives Matter rally was to support you all, you know, to like to find any way to make sure I wasn't taking in over any space, but mm. to find any way that I was going to be able to, um, I guess, take any type of like impact or to take any away type of stress or anything like that. And one of the things that happened is I was helping you monitor um, the administration that was coming through, through the event page um, and through uh, Third, Third Culture Minds who was hosting the event. Um, and there were some threats that came through uh, and they were, they were um, death threats really. And um, w when it had come up, we had first tried to, we kind of, I guess, took, I get crowd control in a way that we didn't want the whole organizing team to find out about this. This is the morning of the Black Lives Matter rally. Um, the, it had been days of really long nights um, and 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 a whole bunch of emotions. So there had to be kind of a few things that we would think about. Um, one, how do we make sure we don't get everyone stressed out in a, and when emotions are already really high? Um, and two, who do we need to look after most? Um, and so there were some on our organizing team and specifically, you know, one and she again, she's not um, she's not black. Um, but I knew that she was, you know, had, you know, mentally she was taking on a lot and she was someone who's very empathetic. And she felt like she needed to take some um, take the toll of, of what was going on. Um, and so I had to remove her because we created a, a separate group chat. Again, the power of social media and the amount of chats we had during that Black Lives Matter rally, of like 30 different chats, create a safety chat, find a lawyer that could be in there, ensure there was a police, you know, someone that was going to look after each other yeah. um, and engage all the people that we had already, we'd already come up with a plan for this, right? For what was going yeah. to happen if something like this happened. So, so the moral of the story there for our audience is that if you are, I guess, uh, thinking about engaging in online social media activism and um, you are not a white male um, um, and are actually likely to be black, brown or a person of color uh, and especially a black woman or a woman of color, 
then um, you should seriously be thinking about actually how do you ensure a sense of safety, maintain a sense of safety in doing in doing so, especially the more visible that you go throughout your journey, the more it's going to get worse. Beth, briefly, in receiving those threats on the day of the rally, we're now here reporting this to the police in the middle of organizing a rally, really threatening messages. Um, I mean, like just clearly threatening. Were you concerned for your sense of safety, but also the safety of others and thinking about actually, have you just done something horrible at that moment? Is that what was going through your head? Um, yeah, yeah. I remember like I was going to work and usually work, uh, I finish work late and um, just like that fear of like busing home and like kind of like getting advice from like the team to like Uber. And I think that's when it became like real to me that like, okay, like there are people out there in New Zealand that would, you know, um, harm you just because you stood up for your rights. And yeah, so during that time, it was kind of like, there was a lot to process. But also like, yeah, that was, yeah, I was, it was kind of, yeah, I was kind of afraid for a little bit. But then, yeah, I kind of was like, kind of faded away. But yeah, for that moment, I was kind of, yeah, fearful. Absolutely. No, I can I can totally imagine. Can I just um, g remind the audience just for the last time, please, if you have any questions, now is your time. We've received two questions so far, which I will be taking. Um, but if anybody else has questions, now is your time because um, the opportunities for questions will be coming to a close soon because the panel will have to conclude uh, quite soon, actually. Um, OK, uh, going back to mental health, Nicole, um, just before we take these uh, questions that are coming in, Seeing this, okay, now we've, we've established that the internet can be a great place for, I guess, you know, creating positive social action um, and so forth and, you know, re revolutionizing societies and et cetera. We've seen it in the Arab Spring and what's happened over there and, you know, I guess different moments and so forth. We've definitely established that. We've discussed that. We've highlighted it for our audience. But what else is it doing? Um, I want to talk about the impact it's having on our own mental health and well-being. What is it like seeing constantly um, videos of black people just, you know, just literally being treated like some kind of animals, like they're worthless. What, how, what does that do to a person? Um, I think it, it just, it's traumatizing, mm. um, because you're not just seeing people beat up, you're seeing people murdered, like mm. in front of your face. And, um, I think the hard thing is be, the hard thing is to know what to do and when and how much stuff you should be aware of and mm -hmm. regulating that um, mm -hmm. because, because this is your community, you feel a sense of loyalty to your community and you know that someone's lost their life or something and you don't want their, their life to be this insignificant thing, but you also have to take care of your mental health Mm -hmm. Um, and for a black person, uh, um, and from my experience, a black person from the States is extremely overwhelming to see all of these things all the time. And there's this sense of helplessness that you have, um, uh, in regards to just feeling like I, what, what else can we do to stop this stuff? And even the point that you had brought up about, how our phones and taking videos are a form of us protecting ourselves. And just can we sit with that for a second, that that's the only way that we can secure our life is to take a video of a police officer or a um, person that's wanting to harm a black life in hopes that they'll second, uh, they'll have a second, um, they'll second guess their actions and, or, and they'll rethink what they're about to do. And that's like, I think if the viewers are what the, if what the viewers can take home as just weigh on, on yourselves a bit, like that's, that's our only form of defense hmm. is hmm. to take a video to protect ourselves, but it's not like a guarantee. Um, and I think it's also very stressful being in another country and seeing the absolute assault on your people. Um, and you get anxious. So for my experience, getting anxiety, getting depression, getting like panic and all sorts of stuff, like having panic attacks because you, 
get in a thought cycle of like, am I ever going to see my family again? Or am, something could happen and my dad could be like murdered by a policeman just for mm -hmm. having um, looked at them differently or having a busted taillight or speaking up for himself or something like that. And all of my black family, I'm just like, I have a lot to lose, you know? And so then it's hard to also be in spaces with mm. um, Pakia that are like blissfully unaware of that. And you have this reality in a constant cycle in your brain. And then the process of having to explain that reality and then people having like dumbfounded um, reactions. Uh, it, it's just a cycle where you feel you feel triggered at all times. So I've had to essentially take the Instagram app off of my phone. Mm -hmm. I've changed my internet browser from Google to a one that doesn't store my data mm -hmm. and um, all of this sort of stuff to kind of like mm -hmm. protect my mental health. And mm -hmm. even I don't have the Facebook app on my phone anymore. Yeah. If I want to look on Facebook, yeah. I go yeah. on my computer. So I really oh. have had to put gateways in place to protect myself mentally because it does take yeah. a toll and it deteriorates your health. I thank you so much for eloquently, um, I guess, highlighting the mental health implications of it because yeah, when racism isn't, I've always said when racism isn't killing us or getting us slaughtered in our places of worship, it's literally killing us slowly because it's making us sick. Um, Beth, just briefly, and, and others, and um, Yana and also Vera, just, just real briefly, do you guys have anything that you'd like to add in terms of, um, I guess, how you look after your own mental health and well-being when engaging in activism and advocacy on the internet or social media? Please, just real briefly, guys, quick fire. Oh, okay, I'll go first. Um, yeah, I think like your longevity is like way more important than like kind of constantly like being like have feeling like you have to be in space where you have to constantly like explain yourself or like educate other people. Mm. So you do need to like kind of step away. Like it's not your responsibility as a black person to kind of educate mm. everybody around you. Um, mm. So I think it's okay to kind of, you know, kind of step away and to kind of like, like fill your own cup. And mm -hmm. yeah, and that's what I'd say. And don't ever feel guilty to kind of feel, I mean, to um, take care of your yeah. own mental health. No, you're absolutely right. Mental health should always become first. Um, Yana, um, Vera, is there anything you guys do? I, I check out of Facebook sometimes. I just check out sometimes just completely. I'm just, I just go ghost mode. Um, that's me coping. That's that's me literally just keeping my own mental health and well-being in check. So um, yeah, do do whatever that works for you. Mental health is important, and please be conscious about that. If you know other young people that are involved in the space, be able to support them in that sense. Look, um, we're almost at the end of our panel. Um, I want to be able to close off on uh, you know a question that we had received uh, from from the audience, um, and and I want to come to each each and one of you. So I'm gonna. Um, start off with you, Yana, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Where would you like to see, sorry, where would you like to see the future of online activism go? You know, how do we reach um, people who might not be watching the activists online media? I guess this, that second part of that question we've previously kind of touched upon, um, but just, just in terms of that first bit, where would you like to see the future of online activism go? Just 30 seconds. Um. If we're talking ideal world, then there wouldn't need to be a thing called activism, right? Yeah. We would all just be decent people and we wouldn't need to organise and we wouldn't need to come together to kind of fight against things like racism. Um, but the future of online activism is that people engage, uh, at least if we're not talking ideal world, people engage uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 a, in a meaningful way and not a shallow, hollow way. Um, and then again, they do that offline. Again, online yeah. is nothing until yeah. you do it offline. But I do want to touch on the, sec the answer to the second question a little bit. Yeah. How do we reach the people who might not be watching the activist online media? That is the offline conversation. Yeah. Because if they're not, I mean, apart from you posting constantly, yeah. um, if they're not seeing the stuff, just like yeah. Nicole was talking about earlier, if they're not seeing it on what they're doing, then you show it to them. You yeah. have those conversations with them. They yeah. can't. I, they can't, you know, filter out the conversations that you have. No, you're absolutely right. Thank you for that. Beth, um, 
any any i guess where would you like to see the future of online activism go any thoughts on that um i think just like more awareness of yeah. um, mental health and mental well-being on social media mm -hmm. um kind of having you know um like kind of not restrictions but like mm -hmm. kind of having limitations on mm -hmm. um just being aware of like how much we take on and how much we take on like the information um in what's happening around the world i think more awareness and more kind of like yeah kind of Absolutely. education around like stepping away from like social media when yeah. we use yeah no so using that awareness both online and also in real life offline as well echoing what yana has said um uh Vera, I believe Vera. Yes. Any, 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 any thoughts in terms of where you'd like the internet to go? Just real quickly, because we are out of time. I think I would just really hope that we wouldn't need videos of cool. our people getting killed, so that people actually start um, fighting against it. Mm, mm, mm. And finally, Nicole. I think if if it can be used as a catalyst to really mobilize, like it is, but then also. Um, holding um, our political figures to account um, mm. as to what they're doing to ensure the safety of the people that they are supposed to be taking care of. Um, I think that is a big part of it is just making sure, okay, we're doing these movements and stuff, but we need to be swaying the, um, the, uh, the um, influencing the minds that yeah. are that are creating the big decisions. You're absolutely right there. Look, um, I, I can't help myself, but also just quickly add, add one in there myself, despite the fact that I'm the moderator. Um, my one would be, my hope would be that I hope we can make it much more, um, you know, inclusive, safe um, for young people to be able to engage in it. The online hate, um, the troll, the abuse, all of that, it's just, it's, 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 it's not okay. Um, it, it, it basically, it's all, you know, and it, it, that's what the bigots and these haters want. They want to be able to silence us. Um, I don't think there's a lot being done in that space. Um, I think the internet can be really unsafe, um, particularly if you are wanting to use your voice in a very public, visible way. Um, just as I have done. And I've experienced firsthand the backlash that results as a result of that. And, you know, when young people come up to me and they say, oh, Gulet, I want to be a community advocate just like you. I want to be staunch for my community and speaking up for them. I, I sometimes want to hesitate and just advise them. No, you don't. Like, you actually have no clue what it's like. And it's unfair that, you know, that we receive such experiences just based on you know, our backgrounds, essentially our ethnicities, you know, religion and so forth, these um, characteristics that um, differentiate us. Um, but really, we all uh, have so many more commonalities. And, and this issue that I'm highlighting, um, you know, still very much goes to the second part of that question, which, um, you know, in terms of what can others do? You guys can help be a part of that phase, you know. Look, we still have not been um, given the uh, hate speech laws that we have been promised. We're still waiting for that. Um, you know, uh, internet online hate is rising by 50%. So much for Christchurch call. I don't see anything happening. You know, in fact, you know, people are still, I'm still, yeah, the internet is just not safe. And, and talk to your local MP, write to the prime minister, um, you know, demand change um be a part of it don't leave it on just us that's too much of a burden so that's what i would challenge you all those that are looking for something to do and to be an ally please that's what you can do in this space and, and what i'm saying very much probably resonates with other parts of stuff that you've heard from other parts of the conference including you know the session on misinformation and so forth and, and the harm that that creates um so guys i just want to you know just wrap up our discussion um, basically, in a, in a, somebody asked the question earlier on. They said, you know, what do you think about the pile-on effects that social media can, you know, can it create a positive or negative effect? Based on the conversation that we've had in this panel discussion, um, the short answer is that basically it has both positive and and negative effects. Um, you know, the internet, and for me, even in my experience, has been a powerful tool in being able to bring about meaningful change, not just bringing 20,000 people out to the streets, but mobilizing people to maintain that energy, to get that change that we want, to ensure that that online activism leads to offline results. That's something that I'm most passionate about. Um, and that's something that I've int intended to focus any of my advocacy work in the past. So um, we have a long way to go. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's an important part in terms of, as our panelists have stated, in terms of helping people feel like they are heard, their experiences affirmed, and that they're not crazy, that they're not going through it alone, do you know? Sometimes as a black person, you're just like, oh my God, am I just going crazy or is this shit nuts? Excuse my language. But um, yes, yeah, so um, there is also the negative um, side of it, as we've, you know, outlined. Um, you know, firsthand from, you know, myself and also the organizers of the Black Lives Matter rally and what they had to endure in, in organizing um, a protest and so forth. So, um, you know, go well, be mindful of these issues. Um, if you know, you know, um, people that are involved in this space, be able to, to support them, um, encourage them. And, 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 you know, there's ways that you can get involved, even if you're not from that impacted community, and to still be a strong, staunch um, ally. So, I just want to thank every single one of um, our panelists. Um, thank you, uh, Nicole, Yana, Vera, Salom. You, your contributions have been amazing, um, and we are so much better for it. So I really, really want to thank you um, for, 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 for that. Um, and also, I... Uh, Beth, thank you so much as well. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention you there. Um, but also... Um, Look, reach out, feel free to get in touch with us. We are all on, you can find us on social media. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer, you know, in our own separate time. But um, I want to thank every single one of you guys for attending this session. I hope that it was useful. And, you know, it's been a real pleasure to be able to moderate this session. Um, I hope that it's been valuable. And big shout out to the team at Internet NZ, uh, especially Jess and, and Nicola for having us here today. Thank you very much.